Foundation. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is John McGuire and I am co-chair of the City Club's program committee. I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our speaker today, Deborah Herzman, chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. The NTSB is an independent federal agency that conducts accident investigations across all transportation modes. It promotes transportation safety by issuing safety recommendations based on its investigations and by advocating for safety improvements. Our speaker, the 12th NTSB chairman, is the first chairman to hold a commercial driver's license. Her, her CDL is with passenger, school bus, and air brake endorsements. She also holds a motorcycle endorsement and is a certified child passenger, uh, child passenger safety technician. More than these distinctions, our speaker who has been NTSB chairman since 2009 and a member of the safety board since 2004 is an articulate and effective advocate for transportation safety. Hallmarks of our speaker's leadership include a deep commitment to improving traffic safety. Under her leadership, the NTSB has focused on safe, uh, key safety issues, including fatigue, impaired driving, and distracted driving. Last December, the NTSB sparked a national debate by recommending a ban on the use of portable electronic devices while driving. Before joining the board, our speaker was a senior professional staff member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, where she worked extensively on key transportation legislation, notably the Motor Carrier Safety Improvement Act of 1999, which established the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. She also worked on the Amtrak Reform and Accountability Act, the Pipeline Safety Improvement Act of 2002, and other key transportation safety and security measures. In 2009, President Obama nominated her to be NTSB chairman after she had served as a board member for five years. Last year, the president renominated her for a second term as chairman. Our speaker's passion for safety can be summed up in her own words. Here's how she describes the NTSB's role. Our charge is to recommend what we think is in the best interest of safety of the community. We are the conscience and the compass of the transportation industry. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the conscious, Conscience and Compass of Transportation, NTSB Chairman Deborah Herzman. Thank you so much, John, for that gracious introduction. And what an honor it is for me to be here to speak at the Cleveland City Club. Thank you to all of you for braving the crowds and the traffic to come hear me talk today. And I know I'm a Washington, Washington insider, and we actually have a much more well-known Washington insider who's in Cleveland today, <laughs> my boss, President Obama. Uh, I know he's speaking just 15 blocks away, so I appreciate the time that you've given to me today. It's such a thrill to be in the city of Cleveland. I don't know if you all know this. I know you're celebrating your 100th anniversary, but did you know that Cleveland actually was the city that had the nation's first traffic light. All right, so you, what, you know that, great. <laughs> Cleveland also had the first pedestrian crossing button. So that's another first that we have here in Cleveland. And so as you can tell, I'm gonna be very interested in talking to you about transportation safety today. What I'd like to do is outline the challenges that we've overcome when safety prevailed and changes were made and highlight the challenges ahead to build a stronger and safer future. We're here in Cleveland and in Cleveland, you have everything. You've got highway, aviation, rail, transit, marine, and those ubiquitous pipelines. <laughs> Cleveland is the perfect place to make the case for investigate, investing in transportation's future. You know there's always more work to be done and I saw it myself on my ride here this morning. In Ohio, there are dozens of construction projects, including one right here on the I-90 Interbelt Bridge uh, here in town. When you look at the statistics, the Federal Highway Administration notes that one in eight 
of our nation's 600,000 bridges is in need of repair or replacement. Now, I'm going to ask you to think back, and I know we've got some students in the room, so you weren't born when this happened, but some of you all here in person and on the radio might remember the 1967 Silver Bridge collapse over the Ohio River. It was about 5 o'clock. It was rush hour on a Friday afternoon in December when the 39-year-old bridge began collapsing. Within a minute, the entire structure collapsed, plunging 31 cars into the frigid river. And then the span collapsed onto the shorelines, both in Ohio and West Virginia. 46 people died. Nine were seriously injured, and a major transportation route was destroyed, disrupting lives and commerce and striking fear across the nation. President Johnson established a task force on bridge safety, and the newly created National Transportation Safety Board began one of its first investigations. As an independent federal agency, the NTSB was established that very year to investigate transportation accidents, determine their probable cause, and make recommendations so that they wouldn't happen again. After a lengthy investigation, the NTSB identified the cause of the collapse, the failure of a crucial comp component in the bridge, a flaw that went unseen during visual inspections. Recommendations that we issued in that investigation prompted the U.S. Department of Transportation to develop bridge inspection standards as well as a national bridge safety program. So fast forward to today, 45 years after the Silver Bridge collapse. The replacement bridge, the Silver Memorial Bridge, that opened two years to the date after that 1967 collapse, is now older than its failed predecessor. Design and construction decisions across transportation are not just about what works today, but also about taking the long view and making decisions that protect individuals and provide benefits to the larger community. So I know there's a lot of Indians fans probably here in the room, so please indulge me while I use a sports metaphor to emphasize my point about investing in the short term versus investing in the long term. Now, you Indians fans may know about Washington's baseball phenom, our pitcher Steven Strasburg. His first major league road start was actually here in Cleveland two years ago. Two months after that game, Strasburg had Tommy John surgery. He came back late last season, and ever since then, his, closes were, his pitches were closely monitored. And as baseball fans know, the Nationals, who clinched their division on Monday, were competitive this season for the first time since, well, since that first silver bridge was built. <laughs> yes, Strasburg's pitching was key, but he pitched his last game for us on September 7th. He was healthy. He felt like he could still pitch, but the team leadership shut him down in the height of a pennant race, not for the short-term gain, but for the long-term, for his and the team's long-term health and success. While it may have been a controversial call, and let me tell you, there's a lot of debate about this in Washington, it was, without a doubt, a leadership call. And that's the lesson to learn from the Washington Nationals organization. Leadership means taking a stand and making decisions for the long-term health and success, regardless of the competing pressures for immediate gratification, which is a big part of our culture today. 
Investing in the future is hard. Taking a thoughtful and strategic long-term approach, I would put forward that's exactly what our U.S. transportation system needs. So what is the NTSB, one of our country's smallest organizations in the federal government, with only 400 employees, people that you may never meet, what do we know about transportation? And what does that have to do with you? And what do our engineers, our human factors experts, and safety advocates have to do with investing in the future? I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. It's, the answer is a, a lot. The NTSB has conducted 150,000 investigations in the last 45 years. From those investigations, we've identified key issues, worked to overcome resistance to those changes that we've recommended so that safety could prevail. It's really important to remember that every accident is a tragedy, and every safety investment has a story. Behind each improvement are the names and the faces of lives lived and lives lost, like the 46 men, women, and children who perished in the Silver Bridge collapse. Since 1967, when the NTSB was established, about 2 million people have perished in transportation accidents in the United States. 2 million. That's the equivalent of the total residents in Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Toledo, and Akron. What have we learned from those two million tragedies? Let's start with commercial aviation. In 1967, aviation was a fairly exclusive form of transportation. But today, air travel is mass transportation, carrying more than 730 million passengers annually in the U.S. But more to the point, the airlines are in an unprecedented period of safety. There has not been a U.S. air carrier crash in three and a half years. Zero fatalities. But that doesn't mean that we haven't gotten close. Look at the so-called miracle on the Hudson. We all remember that iconic image of the passengers standing on the Airbus wings waiting to be rescued. Well, I'm here to tell you that that was no miracle. The successful outcome in the Hudson was the direct result of a highly skilled and trained flight crew, a well-designed aircraft, effective emergency evacuation procedures, and so much more. Just like many other instances, when passengers have walked away from the scene of a crash, it is all about the work that went in before the accident. How many of you can recall a crash in December of 2008 that was hailed as the Christmas miracle in Denver when a 737 veered off the runway, hit a 40-foot berm, and ended uh, in fire. All of those passengers got off. Likewise, there was a runway excursion in Toronto. The hull of the airplane was lost, consumed by fire, but all of the passengers got off. Those lives saved and so many more can be traced to years of accident investigations, safety recommendations, and overcoming resistance. Overcoming naysayers who said it couldn't be done it couldn't work or it was too expensive. But safety prevailed and changes were made. As a result of our investigations, there's now technology in aircraft that prevents the number one cause of airplane crashes today. Pilots who fly perfectly good airplanes into mountains or the ground, something the experts call controlled flight into terrain or CFIT. That used to be our number one killer in aviation, not in the U.S. today. And with Doppler radar, aircraft fly more safely in all kinds of conditions. Traffic collision alerting systems, or TCAS, have helped eliminate 
mid-air collisions for transport category aircraft. As we saw in New York, Denver, and Toronto, accidents are far more survivable. These miracles are thanks to post-investigative in efforts, such as ensuring flight attendants are properly trained and improved <coughs> aircraft crashworthiness. There are fire blocking seats and escape path lighting, just to name a few. All of these things overcame resistance, but safety prevailed and changes were made. Improvements that today are largely invisible to you, the average traveler, and most of them are taken for granted. So for those aviation professionals in the room, I know you've heard these questions before about aviation safety, and people will tell you that the trip to the airport in your car, and this is true, is the most dangerous part of your whole journey. But I'll tell you that that drive is also much safer than it was in 1967. Safety that came from tragedy, from learning, and from investment. Many of you might remember a generation ago, a church group from Carrollton, Kentucky. They were returning from Kings Island near Cincinnati when a drunk driver crossed the highway and collided with their bus, killing 27 and injuring dozens on that school bus. The crash's severity was worsened by a fire that engulfed the bus and the occupant's inability to escape the inferno. From that investigation, the NTSB recommended improved construction standards, enhanced emergency egress, and better occupant protection. Today, school buses are by far the safest way to transport your children and grandchildren and my three sons to and from school. In student transportation during school hours, less than 1% of fatalities occur on school buses. Compare that with 50% of fatalities that occur when a teen driver is at the wheel and 25% when an adult is at the wheel. During my time at the NTSB, I was involved with the investigation of the 2007 accident that killed five members of the Bluffton University baseball team, along with their bus driver and his wife. On the way to a tournament in Florida, the bus crashed in Atlanta going over an overpass. And a significant factor in this accident's severity was the bus's poor occupant protection. At the conclusion of our investigation, John Betts, who was the father of David Betts, one of the players who died, he came to our board meeting. He listened to our recommendations, and he vowed to improve bus safety. And he did. He talked with the media, he worked with his legislators in Washington, and he attended congressional hearings. Earlier this year, a number of bus safety provisions sponsored by Senator Sherrod Brown and Kay Bailey Hutchison of Texas were signed into law requiring enhanced occupant protection, including crush resistant roofs and anti ejection windows. These were all things that were long recommended by the NTSB. Once again, safety prevailed and changes were made. No other family should go through what John Betts and the Bluffton families endured. What about transit? Another growing and important form of transportation. Let me tell you about another accident that I went to. It occurred on a warm summer afternoon in 2009. Two metro trains in Washington, D.C. collided, killing nine and injuring dozens more. The train detection system that failed that afternoon was designed and installed during Metro's original construction in the early 1970s. But the Washington Transit Authority had put off upgrading their system, and they couldn't get the funding for replacing the oldest cars in their fleet, which we had recommended after earlier accidents. The leadership did not address aging infrastructure and invest in Metro's future. 
It wasn't until after the 2009 tragedy, nine lives, intense public scrutiny, that safety prevailed and changes were made. They found the money to buy those new cars. The lessons learned in Washington apply to all of our nation's transit systems. In accident after accident, we saw minimum crashworthiness standards on light rail. But those minimum standards exist in almost every other mode, aviation, highway. On Monday, a new law went into effect giving the Department of Transportation authority to set minimum crashworthiness standards for rail transit. That came directly out of that metro accident. Safety prevailed and changes were made. And what about the cars that we all drive on the roadways? The ones that you drive, the minivan that I drive at home? Today we take for granted seat belts, smart airbag technology, rear mounted high brake lights, and so much more. But all of these advances have been accomplished one accident at a time. They too required overcoming resistance, but also we needed people to do things differently, like changing cultural norms, about wearing your seatbelt, about designating that driver, and using child safety seats. When I was growing up, there really were no child safety seats. When we visited our relatives in West Virginia, my sisters and I were not restrained when we were riding in our old Ford LTD wood paneled station wagon. <laughs> and I remember very distinctly one time on that six hour trip that we were taking that my dad, who was a pilot, hit a dog that ran across the road in front of us. My sister Val and I saw this happen from the back seat, and we were really upset as we saw that dog limp off the road. And we asked my dad why he didn't stop before he hit the dog. Well, today I understand just how quick those fighter pilot decision-making skills were. After my dad found the dog's owner, he explained to my sisters and I that he made a choice between the dog and our youngest sister, Michelle. At that time, she was a toddler. She was perched on the armrest in between my parents in the front seat as we were driving at 50 miles an hour down the roadway. Now I'm a certified child passenger safety technician, and my three sons have been properly restrained every time they've ridden in a car since the day they left the hospital. I could not take them from the hospital without showing the nurse their child seat. Parents today do not have to choose between their child's safety and emergency braking. Yes, a lot has changed since 1967. The year the NTSB began working, there were some 47,000 fatalities on our nation's roadways. Now, 45 years later, with more cars on the road, more miles being driven, that number is lower, but it's still too high. 31,000 fatalities last year. So I've talked about the challenges that we faced over the prior 45 years and how that resistance was overcome and safety prevailed. But what lies ahead for us? What are the challenges for the next 45 years? I see three big ones, distraction, aging infrastructure, and technology. First, distraction. In our investigations, we've seen a locomotive engineer texting, running a red signal, and colliding head on with a freight train in Southern California, killing 25 and injuring dozens more. We've seen a tugboat mate distracted by his cell phone and his laptop causing the barge that he was pushing in the Delaware River to run over a duck boat full of passengers, killing two Hungarian exchange students. We've even seen two airline pilots distracted by their personal laptops and out of communication with air traffic control for over an hour, overfly their destination of Minneapolis by more than 100 miles. 
And while we've seen distraction in all modes of transportation, its death toll is the highest on our highways. Our distraction investigations on the highways date back more than 10 years when we investigated a crash in Maryland involving a young driver talking on her cell phone when her SUV crossed the median, flipped over, and landed on a minivan. That conversation ended in five fatalities. Then, in 2004, an experienced bus driver driving a familiar route in Virginia as the second bus in a two-bus caravan was distracted by a hands-free call that he was on. He struck a low-clearance stone bridge, injuring 11 high school students. He sheared the top of that motor coach off, and when our investigators asked him after the accident if he saw the signs about the low clearance, he told them not only did he not see the signs, but he didn't see the bridge before he hit it. And finally, last December, we completed an investigation into a chain reaction crash in Missouri that killed two and injured 38. The cause? A distracted driver who sent and received 11 text messages in the 11 minutes prior to the crash. That's when we issued our strongest recommendation yet. Not just focused on airline pilots or locomotive engineers or people on the waterways or bus drivers or truck drivers. We called for a nationwide ban on the, portable, on the use of portable electronic device use by all drivers. That recommendation struck a chord, as it should. As before, we identified a key safety issue, taking attention away from the task at hand. And we're seeing resistance, but we've also had a lot of support from highway safety advocates, from other government officials, from the telecommunications industry, and from a number of states who, like Ohio, have enacted legislation that begins to address this growing problem. But for safety to prevail, societal norms must change. Our second challenge, and I think it's a big one, is maintaining our nation's infrastructure some 600,000 bridges, nearly 4 million miles of public roads, 2.6 million miles of oil and gas pipelines, 120,000 miles of major railroads, and more than 25,000 miles of commercially navigable waterways. That's a lot of infrastructure to take care of. And we all know that the state of our infrastructure is not as strong as it should be. We've heard the call for investment from commuters who are tired of congestion, from regions wanting growth opportunities, from the U.S. Chamber, and more. President Obama often cites a report card from the American Society of Civil Engineers that gave our nation's bridges a C and our roads a D. Would you be satisfied if your child brought home that report card? As a parent, I know that I would be convinced that my child could do better, and so can we. The condition of our infrastructure drains tens of billions of dollars from the economy, costs motorists billions in vehicle maintenance and lost time, and contributes to traffic fatalities and injuries. And that infrastructure, not maintaining it, can be deadly, as we've seen in our pipeline investigations. In San Bruno, California, a half-century-old pipeline ruptured, killing eight and leveling a neighborhood. There must be a commitment to investment in our infrastructure before it fails rather than after. Investment is all about taking that long view like what the Washington Nationals did when they benched their star pitcher. Our final challenge is the wise use of technology. It can be tempting to see technology as the answer to every problem, but there are always risks and trade-offs to be understood and addressed. For example, in our Washington Metro investigation, we found that they had an operations center that did uh, uh, identify system anomalies 
and sound alarms when those anomalies were detected. But they had hundreds of alarms going off in their control center every day to the point that the people there became desensitized and ignored the alarms. Yet, let's take a look at those safety benefits that we can gain from technology, and there are many. You'll remember a few years ago the collapse of the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis? Well, their replacement bridge is fully instrumented to provide real-time data about the health and integrity of the structure throughout its life. Yes, technology can bring us more information and data, but it's essential to use that data to be preventive and to make sure that safety prevails. Technology has provided us with great vehicle safety benefits, such as anti-lock brakes, side curtain airbags, and electronic stability control. Many of these things are standard in the cars that we all drive. And on the way are lane departure and collision uh, avoidance warning systems. But what about the technology that distracts vehicle operators, like in those investigations involving cell phones and laptops? And we know those distractions are only going to grow as drivers check Facebook, book dinner reservations, and purchase movie tickets, all while behind the wheel. While technology does present problems, I would put forward that it also provides solutions. Consider the autonomous car. Last year, I rode in Google's self-driving car as it negotiated a busy California freeway. It avoided other vehicles, slowed and sped up with the flow of traffic, and merged on and off the interstate. And when necessary, it turned over the controls to the human. It was pretty remarkable to think about what that car could mean for aging drivers, for busy parents, and for the disabled. Last week, California legalized driverless cars. Yes, we must invest in technology, but we all must also ensure that technology solves problems and doesn't create new ones. Addressing distraction, wisely investing in transportation infrastructure, and the smart use of technology. That's what it's going to take to build a stronger future so that safety can prevail. We all lost an American hero this year, Ohio native and astronaut Neil Armstrong, known by all for that small step for man and giant leap for mankind. And I like to think of Neil Armstrong the way that his family asked that he be remembered. They said, honor his service, his example of service, accomplishment, and modesty. And the next time you walk out, outside on a clear night, and you see the moon smiling down on you, think of Neil Armstrong and give him a wink. That's what we at the NTSB strive to do. And in our case, it's to be an example of service, accomplishment, and safety. The next time you meet a flight, get off a bus, or drive home safely, think of all of the people from the NTSB, from across government and industry who work hard to make changes so that safety can prevail. Thank you so much. We are very honored today to welcome uh, Deborah Herzman, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, to our podium. We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions. Please formulate questions now and remember to be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Closed captioning of our programs is made possible by the Nordson uh, Corporation. Today is the Progressive Corporation Endowed, Endowed Forum on Progress. We thank you for your support. 
Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hosteller. We thank you for your support. We'd also like to welcome students from St. Martin de Porres High School and John, and John Hay School of Architecture and Design. Students are here as part of the City Club Student Program. Today's student attendance is made possible by a gift from the Fred E. Scholl Foundation, Bernie L. Carr Chairman. Will the students please stand to be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome guests from everyone, uh, including guests. Holding the microphone today is Program Director Carrie Miller. First question, please. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. At least one of the candidates for president has promised to do a lot of uh, cutting of expenditures and uh, during the debate mentioned the public broadcasting system. Uh, how does your organization stand in that, uh, uh, in that way? Have there been any uh, suggestions that NTSB be reduced? Well, the good news is so far we've flown under the radar screen, but I think one of the things that's uh, important for people to remember is we are a very small agency, and so um, the value for the taxpayer uh, that they get it's just a little bit more than a quarter per person uh, of your tax dollars to finance the NTSB. So uh, we do try to make sure that we're frugal and uh, we, we uh, are good steward of resources, but uh, we all are facing, everyone in the government is facing potential cuts um, with the sequester coming in January. If something doesn't take place before that, our agency is facing an 8% cut. The uh, media has been covering stories lately about uh, misses, near misses, and accidents on the runways of airports. Uh, what's your reaction to that and what's being done? Well, the NTSB has a most wanted list of transportation safety improvements, and this is our top 10 list, if you will. One of the issues on our most wanted list is improving runway safety or improving airport surface safety. And so we have made a number of recommendations over the years. We see many close calls. It's good news that we're looking at those close calls to see what we can learn from events and incidents rather than accidents. But there are still more things that we can do. And one of the most recent recommendations that we made just a couple of weeks ago involved putting cameras on very large transport category aircraft like the A380, and I'm sure some of you all have seen the footage of a regional jet being struck by a large aircraft uh, on the taxiway. And so this is so that they have better visibility when they're in the taxiway environment. I will tell you that my 2005 minivan actually has a uh, backing camera in it. So this technology is, is um, technology that we've asked the aviation industry to consider. Uh, for in the runway environment, in the taxiway environment, because we've seen a number of wing and tail strikes in the last year or two. Yes, uh, I see constant repair being done on highways. It seems that the highways last maybe five, six years, and they got to be completely repaired. Why is that? Can they do some, could they repair them better and make them last longer in Northeast Ohio. <laughs> Particularly on the route that you drive, <laughs> yes. So I, I think this is definitely one of our nation's challenges is keeping up with our infrastructure demands. And I think that there are so many assets that we have, but nothing lasts forever. You've gotta be able to inspect it and maintain it and take care of it. And one of the areas where we do fall behind is in the area of how much we're spending on maintaining those highways and maintaining those systems. And so um, when we look at these older roads, they really do require a lot of maintenance. I know that there's ongoing efforts to try to identify better materials, better technology, um, and better ways to do that. But it is a wear and tear issue. You're going to see different um, you know, different demands and different needs in different parts of the country based on the environmental conditions and the weather conditions. But this is why we have to invest because, as you mentioned, there is constant, uh, constant work going on. We've got to be able to do it, do it right in the beginning, design it correctly, and then maintain it over its life. 
and design it not just for what our needs are today, but the needs are in the future so that it enables growth and capacity. Uh, Ms. Herdsman, Herdsman. Uh, would you give us some insight as to the means of bringing about uh, change? Can it be done at the federal level by executive order, or must there be uh, regulation? I'm thinking particularly of distracted drivers. Now, also, how much is a responsibility of the federal government, and how much uh, of state governments, and how much of local communities? For example, we have one community in uh, Cuyahoga County which forbids driving while talking on the cell phone. If it's good for Beechwood, why isn't it good for the other 58 uh, jurisdictions in Cuyahoga County? Wh who, who should decide? Well, that is a great question and a very difficult one to wrestle with because we've seen approaches taken on different uh, issues in different ways. And so our recommendation was to the 50 states to pass laws prohibiting the use of portable electronic devices. But to be honest with you, there's a many different ways to approach this. Um, we have seen uh, federal incentives uh, over time for improvements to highway safety, whether it's 0.08 uh, blood alcohol content or, um, or prohibitions on, on funding. But we have also seen more recently a really a focus at the local level. And I will you know, tell you that it's very interesting that you bring this up because that is a perfect example. We are seeing municipalities all over the country take a stronger stand than, than their states or than the federal rules, particularly on distraction. It's the communities, it's the city councils, um, it's the counties. They are the ones paving the way on distraction. They are leading because they're not, they're not getting that leadership from the level above. And so in some ways, I think it, it is a grassroots effort. But more than that, I think it has to be about individuals changing their behavior. And I think if we think about the res resistance to seatbelt use, to child seats, um, the concerns about drinking and driving, and I think even about smoking and how societal behaviors have changed in a generation. It's about now we won't get in a car with somebody who we know is intoxicated and has been drinking too much. It's going to take the students getting to a point where they won't get into the car with someone who's texting and driving. It has to be a decision, I think, that happens simultaneously at the individual level you know, at the state level, at the national level. And it has to also, um, I know many of you all are business leaders. That's another level where it can take place. When I became chairman in 2009, I put a policy out where I prohibited our employees from using their cell phones um, uh, or their portable devices while they were driving on government business with a government-issued cell phone in a government-rented car. Everyone needs to address this issue. We're not going to have the solution coming from only one level. It's going to have to be three things that we know make a difference. Good education, good laws, and good enforcement. And I think we will see behavior change when we see those three things take, take place. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Um, I want to uh, stand up for those who ride bicycles for transportation. While we may not be the part of the high school, the uh, highway constituency, uh, we are among the prime beneficiaries of reductions in drunken driving and texting driving, which is equally dangerous. And so my question is, how does the information and the research of NTSB get out to state and local governments and or the, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and how does that uh, will they use their clout to try and encourage state and local governments to enact their own restrictions uh, through their grant making process, their contracting process, and things like that? And thank you for that question because that actually is another piece of this. On the distracted driving, there are incentive grants that were passed in the most recent highway bill. I mentioned some bus safety improvements. They also had grants in there for states that conduct distracted driving campaigns to get federal funding. and so. Um, there are a lot of different pieces of this, and I think everyone's working to try to get success. But I think the one thing that gets, gets lost, it's not just texting that's the problem. It's texting and talking on the phone. It's hands-free 
as well as handheld. It's not the function of actually holding something in your hand that's the distraction. It's the cognitive distraction that's going on when you're not paying attention to what's happening around you. You really get a narrowing of your focus, a narrowing of your attention. You don't see things like bicycles um, because you're not looking for the bicycle. You're not expecting to see it. And so it's very important to recognize that this issue is a big one and it really is going to need focused uh, work at all different levels. And I think you're right. For other people in the community who see the successes of curbing some of this, to actually step forward and talk about it is a positive thing too. So thank you for speaking on behalf of bikers. Because we do see a lot of our fatalities on the highways are coming in the form of bikers and pedestrians. It's not just people who are in cars. Over 5,000 fatalities on average per year in the last 10 years of, for motorcyclists. There are a lot of people who are losing their lives on the road it happens one accident at a time, but those people are extremely important um, to the ones that they've left behind. Thank you. At RTA, we employ about 1,900 bus, bus and train operators, and we see people coming in with tremendous different skill levels. And a lot of the difference in skill levels are based on the training or lack of training they received initially. I know when I went to school 100 years ago, we had a driver's ed program that was very comprehensive. Many schools don't have that today. Are there any minimum standards that you are, rec two part question, any minimum standards that you're recommending state by state, local by local, to obtain your license in terms of, of training and, and even age? And secondly, another issue that, that seems to be uh, rampant is speed limits going higher and higher and higher, which I assume our cars are safer, but I assume has a higher fatality uh, as well. I just heard that, I think it was, some, I think it was Texas, no, it was some 85 mile per hour roads. Yeah. How is that impacting safety? Great questions, and let me answer the first one. One of the great gains we've seen um, in the last generation is the implementation of graduated driver's licensing laws. And these, um, all of the states have really embraced um, trying to raise some of the standards or requirements. That's a little bit different than the training piece of it. But the standards, um, we've got states that um, have graduated driver's license uh, requirements that limit the number of passengers, the number of teen passengers you're allowed to have. We know that if you have four teen passengers in the car with a teen driver, they're four times as likely to have a crash. Um, we've also uh, supported GDL restrictions based on nighttime driving restrictions, where the environment is a little bit more challenging and the other people on the roadway might create problems. We've also recommended, uh, again, the electronic device restriction for um, novice drivers. And so the GDL program has been effective in driving down teen fatal accident rates. But the training question is a different issue. And I think um, we held a forum uh, on um, driver education uh, back in the early 2000s. And we did put out some information from that. But there is a lot of inconclusive uh, information about what the most effective driver's ed methods are. I think when it comes to commercial drivers, that is a different issue. Um, it is important to make sure that all of those, particularly commercial drivers, uh, have the training that they need. And I know that that's probably something that you're working very closely with other providers on to understand what the best regimen is. Um, we have a number of recommendations in those areas, and I can talk to you about them. But chief among those uh, are the, some of the distraction issues, but also health uh, issues, things like sleep apnea and other problems that um, are, are fairly newer. You know about many of the issues to address with training, but there's also some of these other side issues we've asked transit operators to take a look at. Um, the second question that you asked was about speed limits, and the NTSB has investigated many accidents. I'm sure that you all, this is very intuitive, where uh, speed, is, speed is a factor, and it really is just a very simple equation uh, about uh, about the speed and the mass, and this is why we see um, accidents involving large trucks and buses um, to be uh, particularly problematic for the passenger car driver. It really is. It's, it's, it's very basic. If you have high speeds and if you have high masses, you're going to have problems. And so people operating in vehicles, loss of control of the vehicle, um, all of these issues um, become exacerbated as the speeds in as speeds increase so it is drive 55 stay alive <laughs> yes uh, chairwoman 
Uh, with the uh, passage of texting bans and handheld cell phone bans, um, there are now 39 states that ban texting and nine or 10 that ban handheld cell phones. Um, one of the barriers to getting those enacted has been questions from elected officials who wonder how are these going to be enforced. So is there any type of recommendation or something in the works where law enforcement might have better tools to be able to identify uh, people who are breaking the law? You know, I have to tell you, we held a forum on distracted driving in March, and we did have some law enforcement officials as well as um, prosecutors and others who uh, attended because they've looked at accidents involving distraction. And one thing that comes across, and I don't know if we have any law enforcement here, but law enforcement personnel are extremely competent at identifying bad behavior. They can identify problems, um, and I've been told that um, if a good law enforcement officer can't find a reason to pull you over, uh, you know, in a short period of time, then he's probably not doing his job. And so I think they can look at erratic driving behavior. They can look at not maintaining lane. They can look at not maintaining uh, speed with the rest of the traffic, going too slow, too fast, and, and identify those issues. Absolutely. Are there challenges for law enforcement? Yes, there are. But there are always challenges for law enforcement, and I am not worried at all about their ability to address some of these issues. They will figure out how to address these issues. Reckless driving, dangerous driving, distracted driving, um, all of these things are a hazard. But I'll tell you, from the NTSB's perspective, it is hard for people to know if people are distracted sometimes. And that is why, as a matter of course, in our accident investigations, we routinely put preservation orders on cell phone records. And most of the accidents that I told you all about where distraction was a factor, we didn't even recognize that distraction was the cause of the accident till we were able to correlate some of those cell phone records. And I will tell you, if you're a driver, you need to think about this. If you're in an accident, what is the first thing that people are gonna pull? If you're a, if you're a business, if you're a company and your employees are talking on the phone, you don't have a policy and you don't enforce it, what are people going to be looking at? We have seen a number of record fines and court uh, decisions in this area. People are looking at this. People are getting those records when these accidents happen. If someone runs through a red light and T-bones another car, they'll be looking at the cell phone records. So I think it is, it is an issue for sure um, for law enforcement. I think they're up to the challenge. But I think everyone really needs to think about this um, because the decision you make in an instant um, about responding to something can cost someone else their life. No call, no text, no update is worth a human life. Uh, Ms. Hersman, you spoke about uh, uh, Steven Strasburg. I, uh, I saw that game when he pitched here. Uh, and it's very good, which reminds me, I, I, I have a very good question about uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure safety. But uh, in the meantime, it uh, uh, reminds me of how Bob Feller uh, spoke about, uh, talked to me after 100 games. I think they should let him pitch in the playoffs. But what about the bridges? Uh, are the, uh, uh, Diane, I think that's very important. What exactly are they doing to uh, assure that the bridges in the country are safe? Well, you know, every state has a dedicated cadre of highway and bridge engineers, and I know that they work very hard to identify the problem areas. Um, we do have people who are inspecting those bridges who will determine uh, and prioritize uh, their uh, repair needs. But what I was trying to communicate is our needs are far outpacing uh, what we're doing, and we're not keeping up. And I think in our business at the NTSB, we're only there after something occurs, something catastrophic, something bad occurs. And so what we see are the costs for not, not making those investments. I mentioned a pipeline accident that occurred in San Bruno, California. We've got 2.5 million miles of pipelines. They bring gas to our businesses and our homes. They bring jet fuel to our airports. They're largely unseen because they're underground and people don't think about them. 
but over 50% of our pipeline infrastructure in the United States was, was actually put in the ground before 1970. It's getting older. We have got to be maintaining it. We've got to be inspecting it, maintaining it, and making sure that we're making uh, efforts to replace it or repair it if it needs to be. It's no different than the infrastructure that's above ground. And I think on all of those fronts, whether it's a bridge, we shouldn't wait until it falls down to replace it. With, this, with a pipeline, we shouldn't wait until it leaks to replace it. We've got to figure out how to get ahead of this when it comes to infrastructure investment before we have the accident. Because people find the money to fix it afterwards. It's about doing it on the front end. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Deborah Herzman, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. Thank you, Ms. Herzman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. is